uh, but we are going to move into YouTube. Uh, so I've, I'm starting to get stuff set up on there. So by, <clears throat> by tomorrow, you will see our first uh, posting. And it's actually, um, it's good timing for uh, Dr. Reza's uh, uh, webinar today because we are, what I posted initially is a webinar that uh, uh, Lisa and I did together in 2021 on the basic sargassum pro uh, problem. So that's, um, so look for that starting tomorrow. And again, if, oops, sorry. Ah, there you go. Please use the chat feature. Of, we're we're going to get to all the questions at the end of the uh, webinar, uh, but you can enter your questions in anytime uh, during the course of the webinar, um, and we'll get to them after uh, Dr. Riza is finished speaking. So with that, i um, like to introduce uh, Dr. Tafik Reza. He is an uh, assistant professor at, um, in chemical engineering at Florida, at Florida Institute of Technology. Um, he received his master's and PhDs, PhD degrees in chemical engineering from the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, he's written quite well published, uh, over 91 peer reviewed journals. Uh, he's got several patent, patents, book chapters, and um, quite uh, over 100 oral presentations. So we're very happy that he's here to talk about his uh, this current project. Um, <clears throat> he's also been named um, uh, in the Industrial and Engineering uh, Chemistry Organization, uh, one of the 2021 class of influential researchers. And he's also the recipient of the 2022 New Holland Young Research Researcher Award and is listed in the world top ranking of top two science, top two percent scientists in 2021 and 2022. And uh, a lot of his research is in the field of biofuels and finding beneficial uses of um, of things like sargassum uh, to convert those into biochar. And that's with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Riza uh, to talk about. Um, the use of sargassum biochar for harmful algal bloom remediation. So um, Dr. Reza, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and allow you to share your presentation. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just share my presentation. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Perfect. Yes, that's great. All right, perfect. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Encomio, for the invitation. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's glad to uh, be here, uh, talk some of our results uh, on, on the Sargasm Project and beyond the harmful algal bloom toxin remediation, uh, mostly. Uh, uh, so the Sargasm Project started last year. It's a three-year project uh, funded by uh, EPA, uh, the South Florida Geographic Initiative, and uh, we just passed our one-year mark and, uh, and uh, happy to provide some initial results that are uh, encouraging. Uh, and we'll talk about a little more about what we have been doing in our lab uh, in terms of tackling with other harmful algal blooms uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, so a little bit about uh, my research background, what my research group is doing. Uh, so my core research uh, is on thermochemical conversion that uh, includes the, the biochar production as well as uh, hydrothermal treatment of different waste. I also work with uh, sustainable solvents and uh, different uh, equilibrium and, uh, and, and, and purification uh, of different gases as well as liquid streams. As, uh, 
Uh, so our research group, uh, as you see over here, uh, we are working with biomass, which is part of it that we're going to talk about. So producing biochar from waste material. In waste, we are saying that the abundant material that are available at low cost, can we actually upcycle it so that it can be useful for some other use? So that is uh, part of our research. We also use gas storage, mostly carbon capture, hydrogen storage, etc. cetera. Uh, in terms of water, uh, the, the part of our research we will be providing today is absorption of emerging contaminants, in this case, harmful algal bloom toxins from water. Uh, and I also work with waste plastic, uh, but we're not going to talk about it today, uh, maybe another time. Uh, currently in my lab, I have six PhD students and about 12 undergraduate students. These are my funding agencies, and we'll talk about some of them, uh, what we are uh, going to be discussing today. So uh, it's a little overview of my research group, but uh, today we'll be talking about these two topics, so biochar from waste, as well as absorption of emerging contaminants from water. So I have break down or break it my, my, uh, my talk to two different parts. Uh, the first part, we'll be talking about biochar synthesis or biochar production from sargassum, and we will be using uh, a model compound, methylene blue adsorption for it, just to see uh, whether the biochar from sargassum had the adsorption power. And the second part of it is looking into the harmful algal bloom toxin uh, uh, adsorption. And in this case, most of my most of our research I will be showing today is on microcystine, which is a, a blue-green algae, but we have some other research on pyridinium as well as red tide. Uh, so a little bit about sargassum. Uh, again, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful uh, 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 algae that we can see in the open ocean, uh, and it, it is naturally occurring. And in fact, uh, when, when Christopher Columbus uh, sailed through the United States uh, and Atlantic and uh, in 1492, he discovered sargasso sea, and he had to go pass through sargassum. Uh, and uh, it's, it, 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 it provides a safe breeding ground for fish, sea turtles, and marine life. It's been there forever. However, recently, when uh, we are talking about recent years, there is something called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. And you see uh, the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, it is more than 5,000 miles of sargassum that is starting from uh, Africa, more specifically around Congo area, and then go all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and it can be observed from the space. Uh, I didn't put those uh, pictures, but yeah, it can be observed. Uh, there are some estimation that there could be more than 4.2 million tons of uh, dry biomass or sargassum available uh, at this moment. And if you want to put it into the perspective, it is more than 11 times of the weight of Empire State Building. So sargassum is a natural occurring. It is decent, it is good, but it is growing way too much and we need to find a way to utilize it. Uh, and uh, if you look into the, the density, the darker color, you see that uh, the density is intensified around the Caribbean, uh, around the Florida coast. Uh, so I have a couple of pictures over here. You see that uh, in, in, in Crest Charge Barbados, uh, you have the St. Kitts and Neville. Uh, we have some of our Florida coast as well as uh, the St. Andrews Granada. I think this is a video. Uh, uh, you see there's a sargassum just piling in and, uh, and just, uh, uh, just coming to the shores. Uh, so that's, that's how uh, it looked like uh, uh, during the summer. So uh, about the consequences uh, when sargassum is on the shore and then it started to putrefy, uh, uh, it would emit hydrogen sulfide gases because of the sulfur that came uh, with the sargassum. Uh, so hydrogen sulfide would give you a, a, a rotten egg smell, if you remember uh, uh, the, what is it called, organic chemistry or, or the physical chemistry lab. Uh, it's, it's a rotten egg smell. Uh, and uh, uh, if the concentration is higher, it would cause a mild headache, eye irritation, sometime unconsciousness. There's one paper started to talk about uh, a possible pregnancy complication complication, and uh, they wanted to tie it with uh, 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 with sargassum and uh, hydrogen sulfide related to sargassum. So uh, that's uh, that's happening. And uh, so if you look into the right side of it, it's basically the sargassum would actually be smelly, it would be obstruction, it would be visually unappealing, and it would, would actually affect the tourism, health, and fisheries sector. 
so the current application, I mean, we, we are not uh, uh, we're not just sitting around over here. We are applying it, and uh, uh, Dr. Incomio actually has a, a current project where uh, uh, his group is uh, working on composting of sargassum, which is a wonderful way to uh, to tackle the sargassum. Uh, however, there are some risk of uh, of heavy metal leaching to uh, to different plants. Uh, uh, but but I think uh, the uh, the research that Dr. Incomio is doing, which is very encouraging, so. I was probably uh, going to do more composting, but that would not, the composting of this entire amount uh, would not be viable. So we probably need to find different applications. Uh, I think that the part of Mexico, I think uh, that they were starting to introduce Sarga block. Uh, uh, it's basically the, the building block over, you can see here. Uh, uh, these are good uh, material as well, uh, but however, we need to uh, do the marketing. And so uh, the, to utilize this enormous amount of biomass, uh, we will probably need to have uh, multiple different applications and all of us can actually benefit it from here. So one of the application that uh, we could work on, I mean, I'm a chemical engineer, uh, work with uh, biochar research. So every time I see a biomass, I think about biochar. Uh, so uh, uh, what is biochar? So biochar is a uh, pyrogenous organic material synthesis through pyrolysis. It's a, it's, a, it's a definition of biochar. So it's usually biochar results in slow pyrolysis. There's something called fast pyrolysis as well, which is uh, usually made to make a liquid fuel. But slow pyrolysis is we uh, start with the biomass, then we would do the pyrolysis. The, the word pyrolysis came from two different parts, which is pyro means fire, lysis means breaking down. So pyrolysis means we're gonna break it down in terms of adding with a really hot temperature. However, uh, we are not gonna burn it. So we would probably maintain it at an inert atmosphere. Uh, in laboratory, we would usually add nitrogen. We can use argon. Uh, in commercial scale, they would just put the lead on so that the, the oxygen cannot go in and it would not start it to burn. But however, at higher temperature between 400 to 800 degrees Celsius, it is going to start it to cook it. Uh, so if you do uh, barbecue, you would probably see after the barbecue, there is not too much of uh, where with the part, there are not too much of oxygen reaching. You would see there are some, uh, some char, some, some black material over there. Uh, although that's that's not really a biochar definition, but uh, 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 but it would be like more of a charcoal uh, uh, type of thing. So uh, in terms of biochar, uh, there are several ways to make biochar. We're gonna we're gonna introduce the one that we are applying, uh, but we would probably want because we want to tie biochar with water purification. We want the biochar with high porosity, very high surface area. Uh, uh, the high ash and carbon content as well as pH would make it because I want to know what the, uh, the, the biochar surface charge is so that I can I can probably go into whether it is going to be uh, absorptive of, uh, of harmful algal bloom toxins or not. So a little bit about definition of biochar. Uh, uh, and again, I mean, I, I get a, a lot of question about is biochar charcoal or what is the difference between biochar and activated carbon, something like that. So the definition of biochar is defined by by two different entities, International Biochar Initiative, as well as European Biochar Certificate. So easily the biochar, uh, the IBI, uh, uh, they, they define biochar as a solid material obtained from thermochemical conversion, pyrolysis of biomass in an oxygen limited environment. Uh, and also there is a, a, the minimum carbon content requirement for the biochar. And in terms of IBI requirement, it has to be 10% uh, or higher. European biochar certificate would actually tell biochar, which is at least 50% of carbon uh, is in biochar or higher. So that's what it is. Uh, and uh, in the US, we are not, uh, we were a little bit late, but we're not too late. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Congress passes uh, uh, the Biochar Act of 2022, which is basically biochar innovation and opportunities for conservation, health and advancement. Uh, it's basically allows uh, funding agencies to, uh, to open up funding for biochar production, biochar application, biochar commercialization, et cetera. It's more of a, uh, the, the, the carbon sequestration as well as tackling global warming and converting uh, uh, the waste material into valuable products. So that's that's what we have been doing. Uh, in terms of biochar reaction mechanism, and again, I mean, it depends on what kind of feedstock we are talking about. I try to find something that is more relevant to our sargasm. 
in this case, the seaweed, uh, as you probably know, seaweed comes with very uh, high moisture content uh, in our, when we collected our uh, sargassum samples from Fort Pierce, it was about 83, 85% of water. So the first thing we need to do is dry. Uh, so when we dry it, and then we actually go through a pyrolysis route, which is over here, 800 degrees Celsius, to make biochar. And as you see, the biochar is more aromatic structure uh, and uh, 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 with a very very low oxygen content, uh, as you can see over here. Uh, in our group, we wanted to use biochar uh, for water purification. Uh, and in this case, I need to make it a little bit different route. So instead of drying route over there, we introduce another approach called hydrothermal treatment, which is basically a, a pressure cooker. Uh, so we cook the pressure, we cook, uh, Sargasm seaweed uh, in a pressure cooker to make a, a bio and uh, make a hydrochar, we call the char, and then we take it to the, the pyrolysis of that to make biochar. Again, the, uh, uh, the point being uh, we need to make a, a lot of functionality as well as a lot of porosity in order to tackle uh, this kind of toxin. So, our motivation comes with. Uh, we, we get the sargasm, uh, then we prepare hydrochar, then we make biochar out of it. How do we do it? Uh, so the first step is what we said, the pressure cooker. So it's, it's basically hydrothermal carbonization. It is a closed environment. Uh, uh, we, we, we try to uh, differentiate how the temperature of the first step would actually dictate or, or how it would actually uh, affect on the final properties of biochar. So first we make biochar, or uh, uh, the first step is at three different temperatures, 180, 220, and 260. After that, we take the solid and then do a pyrolysis. And again, this is a lab scale pyrolyzer, uh, uh, other way known as muffle furnace. So I can control the, the nitrogen environment. I can control the temperature very precisely. Uh, so we, we take that one, uh, we apply 400 to 800. So today's result would be more of a 800 degrees Celsius. And we apply residence time to two hours. And after that, uh, because we want to uh, uh, do uh, uh, a water purification, uh, it's, it's a very common step that we wash it. Uh, so we wash the, the biochar with hydrochloric acid, mild hydrochloric acid. Uh, so that's how we prepare our biochar. So take, uh, uh, giving you a little more of results that uh, we are finding. So if you see into the how much biochar we are making, uh, if we start with 100% mass yield of the raw sargasm, we are talking about the biochar that are the last three of them, uh, SH180, SH220, and SH260. These are the ones. So we are talking about 10 to 15% of the mass that would eventually uh, uh, come as my biochar. Again, uh, this is how we uh, we make our biochar. Uh, uh, maybe that uh, if we do a, uh, a direct uh, pyrolysis route, we might be going between 20 to 30 uh, percent. But we wanted to make our biochar targeted for this application. That's why. Uh, so uh, and then uh, the first thing come to our mind is how does the biochar look like? Because we want a lot of porosity. We want a surface area as well. Uh, so if we go into the scanning electron microscopy, we started to see uh, more porosity. And you see that uh, the biochar, uh, that is the first step is hydrothermal at 180. So that started to look into a little more, little less porous than the bigger one that I see a much, much larger pore. So uh, uh, this is a visually, it, it is a farming that we are making porous uh, char uh, uh, from the scanning electron microscopy. Then we take our biochar into chemical characterization. First characterization, we need to measure it. What is the carbon content over it? Uh, because the biochar related with the carbon content. So you see that uh, the raw sargasm, dry raw sargasm starts with about 30, 35% of carbon. Then the carbon content increases significantly with the biochar. And the biochar we are talking about, uh, the, the very last one, if you can see that has about 60% of uh, elemental carbon content, about 20-25% uh, of ash that accumulates as well. Rest of it, we have some oxygen, uh, very little carbon, and uh, no sulfur. Uh, so that's that's what we are, uh, very little sulfur, I should say. Uh, and uh, so that's that's the ultimate analysis that we formed. Uh, then we look into, okay, so my, uh, my biochar uh, that has uh, 
high carbon content, uh, it looked like for us, can we actually measure the porosity and surface area? And uh, we did uh, the BET surface area analysis basically tell us that what is the surface area per a meter square per gram of this biochar. And we started to look into uh, the, the biochar that we have made from a sargasm uh, they go more than 1,000 meters square per gram. Just to give you a perspective, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the more than 1,000 meters square per gram would be a one-tenth of a football field uh, that we can fit it into one gram of biochar that we are talking about. And again, the biochar uh, that is made at, at 260 degrees Celsius hydrochar would actually give the maximum porosity. Uh, so uh, then we we I, we have uh, confirmed that the biochar that we are producing are highly porous, uh, but the question is whether it is functionally active or uh, how much of chemical functionality we have. So we have done that, uh, the chemical functionality, we measured the, uh, the oxygen containing functional groups, and this is uh, measured in uh, in micromole per gram. And uh, we started to see that uh, because we did the first step was to run hydrothermal treatment to functionalize it. So we see that uh, the, the HTC, the hydrochar, get a very high functionality. And then, uh, but, but usually I didn't show the results. Uh, usually they are not porous. In order to increase the porosity, we need to uh, then uh, lose some of the functionality. But eventually we are seeing uh, the SAH260 biochar that would come with more than 1,000 meters square per gram of surface area, as well as more than 400 micromole per gram of functionality. Now, the question is how it actually affects the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, the absorption of property. So in order to do the absorption property, the first thing we need to identify is the, uh, the surface charge of this biochar. As you see, uh, we measured the pH and pH as point of zero charge. Uh, the, the difference between them is basically tells us that whether the, uh, the biochar that we are making, uh, what kind of charge they have. You see that the SAH260 biochar, uh, the pH is higher than the pH of point of zero charge. That means it is more of a negatively charged. So anything that has a, a little bit of positive charge around it, a contaminant, that would uh, likely to come and bind with this biochar. So that's a, that's a hypothesis. Uh, the next question that we have asked ourselves that, okay, the biochar needs to be uh, 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 thermally stable. So we measured the stability of uh, this biochar. And as you see, we increase the temperature, this is in, uh, under inert atmosphere, so we increase the temperature from 25 degrees Celsius all the way to 900 degrees Celsius, and we see only 10 to 15 percent of, 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 of weight loss. So that means that the biochar itself is pretty well thermally stable. So we're, we're talking about thermally stable, chemically functionalized, very high surface area biochar that we can make from this sargassum seaweed. Now, the question is, can we, how can it actually show the, uh, 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 the, the adsorption property? So to measure the adsorption property, we started with methylene blue. Uh, so this is a dye uh, and uh, it, it, it's widely used as a model compound for water adsorption property or adsorbent property. So you see over here is the adsorption capacity. Uh, uh, and we see that uh, uh, for the adsorption capacity, we can go as high as 700 milligram of methylene blue adsorbed per gram of biochar, which is significantly higher, uh, as, as close to as activated carbon, or probably higher than activated carbon that we are producing over here. Then we went into uh, doing the, uh, 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 the uh, the thermodynamic study. So we, we did this very similar test in three different temperatures, four degrees, 20 degree, 37 degree, uh, uh, just, just to see like, okay, if I have a pollutants at different temperatures, how it would affect it, because we know that uh, the temperature can be different. And we see that uh, at, uh, at higher temperature, we see uh, a better adsorption capacity over here. Uh, whenever we talk about this adsorption or equilibrium adsorption, uh, we like to see uh, how the adsorption is happening, whether it is a, a monolayer adsorption or is it a pore filling type of 
possibility. So we'd usually use common isotherm models. So for example, one isotherm model is called the Langmuir isotherm, which is basically a monolayer. So it's uh, uh, so if I have a functional group, uh, uh, my uh, uh, my contaminant could come and then have a very weak or strong uh, chemical bond with them, and that's it. Uh, so that that's my single layer adsorption. Uh, that's the uh, uh, the mathematical equation of it, and that's how we prove that it is a uh, it's a Langmuir isotherm. Uh, the other one uh, is called the foreign leash isotherm, which is basically uh, known as a packing mechanism, uh, which is also that I, uh, the first layer could come in, have some sort of a, uh, a bonding, and then we can start packing it. Uh, so that's uh, the, that, that's a foreign leash isotherm. And we, we applied for both of them in terms of the dye, and then we found out that uh, our study uh, uh, it, it is evaluated that it is more of a Langmuir type isotherm, uh, and with uh, uh, with R square value that that comes out to be 0 0.99. So it's it's more of a Langmuir type isotherm. Yes, it has some effect on on foreign leach type, some poor uh, poor feeling, but uh, the uh, the the monolayer adsorption comes uh, more handy towards it. Uh, Again, then, then we went into the thermodynamic property of it because we wanted to know whether the adsorption would happen spontaneously. Uh, 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 the one way to calculate that one is to calculate the Gibbs free energy, the delta G over here. Uh, a negative Gibbs free energy would means that my adsorption would be spontaneous. That means that I don't have to force it. I don't have to add any kind of uh, 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 heat or energy or take something out of it. Uh, it would be just absorbing by itself. So the, the more negative the delta G that gives free energy is, uh, the more spontaneous the, the adsorption would be happening. So when we plot it for this one at three different temperatures, we see that my delta G is actually negative uh, for all three of them. And it is the 37 degrees Celsius, it is the most negative. So that means that we are talking about a spontaneous adsorption of dye. And we also calculate the, the enthalpy of adsorption, which is about 11.57 kilojoule per mole, which is basically telling us that it is not a very strong chemical bond, but it is a more of a physical to chemical bonding, a very weak uh, chemical bonding over here. Uh, so we, with that, this is what we learned. The, the proposed mechanism that we are thinking that uh, uh, because we see that it is more of a Langmuir type adsorption, we think that it, is, it would be more of an electrostatic attraction because my, uh, uh, my biochar is charged. Uh, it can also have the hydrogen bonding because we see that uh, the delta G is in the, in the range of uh, 12 uh, kilojoule per mole. Uh, it could have the pi pi stacking. Uh, so the pi orbital of the a uh, 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 pi orbital of the uh, uh, the biochar that we saw uh, can actually attract with the pi orbital of the methylene blue dye. And also we saw some of the pole failing. So talking about the, the part one conclusion over here is we, we can make a uh, biochar uh, with a very high surface area sargassum. Now our, our goal is to take this biochar to apply it for water purification. If someone's goal is to just make biochar for soil amendment, uh, we could actually propose a different way of making biochar. But our goal is to see how can we make a very high surface area biochar with very high functionality and how could we uh, actually absorb it, use it as an adsorbent. So we saw that biochar can be made from sargassum uh, it has a maximum adsorption capacity, a very high uh, adsorption capacity for uh, methylene blue dye. Uh, we saw that the, uh, the, the spontaneous uh, adsorption of methylene blue and with this following Langmuir type isotherm, and we see it, uh, we, we predict that it is more electrostatic attraction for that. So that, that's the conclusion of how to make biochar. Now, the next question is, can we actually take this biochar to a harmful algal bloom toxin remediation? Uh, so uh, in, in terms of harmful algal bloom, so let's first talk about what HABs are, what we call the, uh, the harmful algal bloom as HABs. Let's see. All right. So HABs are basically uh, the, the events that, that would involve uh, the release of toxins uh, from a, a, a microscopic planktonic algae uh, that would do it. So it's basically, I would have, excuse me. So I have, 
uh, the hab growing, and then if I have excess nutrient loading that is coming out, and that's why uh, in Florida uh, we would usually say don't don't give fertilizer to our our lawn from uh, from the summer season because this is an excess amount of rainfall. It would be leave it would be leaching all those uh, uh, washing all those excess fertilizer into our our lagoon, and then it would actually be causing as a nutrient loading. So we would have more algae that is growing and then more algae that it grows, what is basically uh, algae grows, it grows bigger, bigger, bigger. At some point, it cannot be any more bigger. So it actually ruptures. And when it ruptures, uh, there are multiple uh, algae that can grow. Some of them can actually rupture and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and emits toxin towards it. So that's what they call the harmful algal bloom. Uh, and, uh, all right. So when we talk about harmful algal bloom, there are three different types of harmful algal bloom. First one uh, is basically it, it is going to absorb your in, uh, excess nutrient, uh, have more photosynthesis, grow a lot of algae. And if I grow a lot of algae, if I cover the entire surface, uh, then uh, the, the, uh, the sunlight cannot deplete. Uh, that could result in the oxygen depletion. So that's my type one. That's nothing to do with toxin. Type two comes with all the toxins. Uh, so it's basically type two is the, uh, uh, the harmful algal bloom that grows. And then uh, when the, the species, when this erupts uh, the cell, it could actually, uh, 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 it could actually toxic, the toxic uh, chemical that could come out from that. So that's my type two. And the type three is the release of a species that would actually be not toxic to the environment, uh, not the environment, not toxic to human or not toxic even to the, uh, uh, the aquatic animal, but it could actually clog the, the fish gill, something like that or, or, or that. So this is my type three. But as you see, uh, when we're talking about harmful algal bloom, a lot of focus has been given into the type two toxin. So if we talk about type two toxin, uh, the harmful algal bloom, uh, there, there are three uh, species that would stand out for the state of Florida. Uh, we are talking about the dinoflagellates and the cyanobacteria. Okay, So that, uh, the dinoflagellates are basically are, are growing in more of a brackish water, uh, uh, more of an estuary. So for example, the Kyrenia brevis, the red tide uh, that we know grows in, uh, in our Gulf Coast in Sarasota Bay uh, and uh, Pyridinium, it grows uh, in, in old Tampa Bay, as well as we have seen evidence in Indian River Lagoon as well. On the other hand, we have the cyanobacteria, freshwater algae, uh, like, uh, uh, like brew green algae, uh, that would uh, probably uh, come out and then uh, grow it over there. So we would have, uh, we'd see uh, this kind of algae grows in uh, Lake Okeechobee or, or maybe the canal that is connecting Lake Okeechobee to Indian River Lagoon. That's where they can grow. Uh, also, the, uh, the cyanobacteria are more common in Great Lakes as well. Uh, so the harmful algal bloom impact over here, you see that the affected industries are usually fisheries and tourism. Uh, it, it's seasonal. I mean, in, in 2021 in Florida, we, we have uh, 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 actually counted 197 events and uh, it would relate to different health effects. So uh, the, each toxin is different. So some toxins are uh, uh, causing paralytic symptoms. Some of them are diuretic. Uh, some of them are hepatotoxic, carcinogenic, etc. The common one that we uh, uh, we found in Florida are blue green algae, uh, and uh, we found also pyridinium and reptiles. So blue green algae would actually uh, emit the toxin called microcystine, which is a liver toxin. Uh, then the pyridinium uh, dinoflagellates, uh, they would actually emit a toxin called saxitoxin, which is a neurotoxin uh, uh, that could actually uh, cause the, the paralytic fish poisoning. Uh, and also the red tide uh, would actually emit the toxin called brevitoxin. Uh, that is a more of a, a breathing hazard that we can think. So in terms of how do we control the, uh, the HAB, so there are different methods that have been developed, biological route, physical route, or chemical route. Uh, and uh, 
uh, again, I mean, the, each of them will have their own advantage and disadvantages, but the one that is coming very close to the commercialization is called the flocculation, more specifically clay flocculation. Uh, and uh, that's what we we'll probably see. Uh, oops. Uh, you see the Mott Marine Lab, uh, 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 my great colleague, uh, Dr. Vince Lovko, uh, they have been working on, uh, on, on red tide initiative uh, uh, and, and working on different clays to, uh, uh, to flocculate red tide uh, in Sarasota Bay. Uh, it turns out that it, uh, 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 the, the proprietary clay uh, can actually make flock and then the flock will actually uh, settle down at the deposition. Uh, the only problem uh, that they are finding is uh, it's basically when the clay flocculate, uh, there is surface tension, and when it becomes a surface tension, some of the, uh, the cells would actually break, and then uh, the toxin will come out from these uh, flocks. And uh, unfortunately, most of the clay uh, would not be effective for toxin uh, uh, adsorption over there. So that's what brings our biochar research come in and we're gonna see like whether biochar can actually be effective on toxin uh, uh, adsorption for this case. So uh, we're gonna talk most of the stuff in microcystine LR, but I, I'll show you some results from our uh, saxitoxin as well as brevitoxin results as well. Uh, so talking about microcystine, this is how it looked like. So it, it, again, this is, the, this is the one which would be uh, resulting in the eruption of blue-green algae. Uh, and microcystine, uh, the, there are more than 200 different kinds of microcystine uh, available. And uh, the, the, the most toxic one is called the microcystine LR. Uh, the LR is basically uh, represent the leucine and arginine uh, uh, that uh, that uh, that that we can see it over here. So that is an hepatotoxic uh, which causes the liver damage. And there are some literature out there uh, showing the evidence that uh, the biochar made from pyrolysis as well as advanced pyrolysis that we have been doing uh, can actually absorb microcystine LR. Now, our goal was to see whether our sargassum-derived biochar can uh, absorb microcystine LR and how it is different than the, the commercial biochar. So I think part of the results are commercial biochar. Uh, we, we, are, we are still working on our biochar research. So uh, talking about the methodology, so we would actually uh, go by our uh, microcystine LR standard uh, and we would dissolve it in ethanol, then water, uh, then we would start using our biochar, commercial biochar, as well as sargassum biochar. We want to do three different things. We want to test our dosage study, like how much biochar would require. Uh, uh, then we would also uh, want to find out what is the maximum absorption capacity of the biochar. Uh, and then we, we want to find out is how fast the absorption is happening. So this is the, the three different things we are going to test uh, in our absorption studies. Uh, our absorption Absorption happens at the room temperature, dark room, uh, because uh, it turns out that microcystine is actually uh, reactive with, uh, with light. Uh, so we then go into the filtration. And uh, finally, the way we identify uh, microcystine is through ELISA, the enzyme-linked uh, immunosorbent assay. Uh, it's basically, uh, this, is, uh, this is a method of a biological method, more of an antibody uh, type of detection. As you see, uh, as you probably remember uh, in COVID, uh, we, would, we would do uh, the COVID-19 testing in PCR method as well as antibody testing. This is basically the similar way we can do for the antibody testing, where we would actually add our, uh, 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 our biological assay and then find out how many were killed uh, by, the, uh, by, this, uh, uh, by this enzyme. And from there, we back calculated to find out what is the concentration of the, uh, the toxin. So that's what we, uh, but first uh, we need to find out what is the calibration uh, curve that we can find out from ELISA. And this is what it looked like for, uh, for a calibration curve. Oh, this is not the PBTX, this is MCLR. 
So uh, we find out that uh, the, the calibration curve, we can only work with between 0.2 to 0.7. So this is where we have a very straight line. This is, the, this is our working range for the calibration. And as soon as we identify this one, we need to find out where it is going to, uh, 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 how much dilution we need to make to actually get into this curve. So that's how we do the calculation. And uh, some of the results that I'm gonna show you. So first we wanna find out what is the dosage required for MCLR. So we found out that, so in this experiment, uh, we vary the dosage rate uh, between uh, zero to 1000 milligram per liter. And uh, we wanna keep our other two variables constant. So one is we're gonna start with 10 PPB of uh, microcystine LR concentration, and we are going to have a 24 hour of, uh, uh, of the absorption time, just to make sure that it, it can actually reach equilibrium. And we see that, uh, probably around 0.4 or, or 5 milligram per 100 milliliter, we are going to see the, the, the more than 90% of removal of microcystine LR over there. So once I identify my dosage rate, uh, then we would go into do an equilibrium uh, to, to find out what is the maximum absorption capacity of, 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 of this, uh, uh, this biochar. And here we are going to vary the initial concentration uh, between 10 to 100 ppb. And uh, we're gonna keep our dosage rate constant as well as our contact time constant. to find out the maximum absorption capacity. And we see that uh, the maximum absorption capacity comes out to be about 200, uh, 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 about 200 uh, milligram per liter. And we would actually find out that uh, uh, that is more of a Langmuir type of absorption as well. So this is, again, a confirmation that uh, the results that we found from our, uh, uh, the, the dye absorption is actually behaving similarly, the, the microcystine LR as well. Uh, then we wanted to find out is how fast the absorption is happening. So in order to do that, uh, the absorption, uh, the, the kinetic modeling, we actually tested several different kinetic modeling. First order kinetics, which is a slow kinetics, pseudo second order kinetics, which is a fast kinetics, uh, the interparticle diffusion, as well as Ilovich model. And you see the, the results shown over here. So here now we are, we are keeping our dosage rate constant, 0.4 gram per liter. We are keeping our initial concentration of MCLR as 10 ppb. We are changing the time. And we see that uh, the changing the time, most of the, uh, the more than 80% of it actually absorbed very, very, very quickly. So which is a good sign. And, uh, and uh, we, we also find out that it is more of a pseudo second order uh, uh, and absorption and where the R square value is 0.999. That means that it is a fast absorption, which is very good because we would probably not apply our biochar and wait for 24 hours to actually uh, absorb all those microcystines. Uh, so with that, I would probably have that uh, the, the absorption mechanism. Again, this is uh, this is more of a, uh, a hypothesis, and we're still testing it because our biochar was negatively charged. We think it would be more of an electrostatic attraction. We have seen some uh, chemical functionality. Uh, so we were expecting that we're gonna have chemical interaction as well. We have seen that uh, the microcystine LR, it has its aromatic ring, so as our biochar, the aromatic ring. So the pi pi bond could be another possibility as well. And eventually we would, um, we would have some pore filling as well. So uh, that, that's what we are envisioning uh, for the microcystine LR. Now, in terms of other, uh, uh, experiments. So uh, we've done with some experiments with saxitoxin, uh, which is actually coming from pyridinium bahaminis. Uh, it's, it's basically, it is how the saxitoxin look like. And when we try to do the dosage study, and we found that the dosage study would, would require about 0.2 uh, 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 gram per liter to make 90% of absorption. The equilibrium study was interesting because we saw it more of a Freundlich type equilibrium because it is more of a pore feeling that the, uh, it, it doesn't reach the plateau, it just keep going up. Uh, the kinetic study shows that again, it's, it, it's most of it are more like uh, uh, the Ivolovich as well as the interparticle diffusion.
Uh, in terms of brevitoxin, which is the, the toxin coming out from red tide, uh, that we uh, we have done with commercial biosure as well as uh, as our other uh, P400 biosure, and we found out that the dosage rate is extremely low. Uh, we were talking about very low dosage rate to actually capture uh, brevitoxin from water. Uh, so this is some of the results that, uh, that that is coming out. Again, these are ongoing project, multi-year, probably have uh, better results and better understanding uh, in upcoming years. So in order to uh, conclude, uh, we probably have the, the biochar, we see that it shows uh, a promising results on absorbing uh, the harmful algal bloom toxin. Uh, we identified that ELISA method can be successful to calibrate toxin concentration. Uh, and we also proved that um, it is, the, when you're talking about microcystine LR, it is more of a Langmuir type absorption. But when we went into uh, 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 toxin, it is more of a foreign dish type absorption. Uh, and we uh, we did find out that it is a, it is a pseudo second order kinetics, at least for microcystine, uh, that means that it is a fast absorption mechanism. So moving forward, <coughs> what we have done so far in our lab, the capability of our lab is flux study. So it's basically benched up flux study, but we want to take it, the flux study to uh, a column study in, 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 in larger uh, column. And uh, you see over here is a Moat Marine Lab, uh, uh, 80 liter columns uh, that would actually be resemble of Sarasota Bay over here, or, or we can make Tampa Bay as well. Uh, then we want to we want to we want to see whether the biochar would be uh, how biochar would be effective as a cell absorption. How would that happen? Uh, when we have the better results, when we have more confirmation, we want to take it to mesocosm and field trial. Of course, we have to deal with uh, the economic assessment. And finally, this is this is our ambitious goal. Uh, we know that clay is very good at flocculating reptile. Uh, now, our goal is to see whether we can actually modify the clay with some biochar, uh, so as when when clay would actually flocculate, if there is or when there is the toxin removal, can biochar be actually capturing that toxin? So uh, that's what our ambitious goal is, see where we can go. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the funding agencies, uh, the EPA South Florida Geographic Initiative, uh, USDA, Florida Sea Grant, Mort Marine Lab is, uh, is, uh, 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 is funding us to, to work with uh, Brevitoxin Red Tide, uh, Tampa Bay uh, is funding us to uh, to work on the, the, the saxitoxin, the pyridinium side of it. Uh, in terms of personal, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Spencer Fire, my colleague here in Florida Tech, for toxin analysis. Uh, Dr. Vince Lovko from Moat Marine Lab, <laughs> Dr. Vincent and Comio uh, for education outreach, as well as the sargasm, uh, the commercial biochar, we get it from Green Carbon Solutions. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, Caddy Ann Chambers, who done most of the uh, the research over here that I have shown you today uh, and, and actually making the slides as well. Uh, and uh, uh, one fun fact is uh, uh, she is originally from Jamaica. So she has seen firsthand how the sargasm actually affect uh, in, uh, uh, in Caribbean uh, uh, countries. So uh, 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 we also want to thank uh, other uh, PhD students and undergraduate students to help us the experimental and characterization. With that, I would like to thank you very much for attending it. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I convey some of the results uh, to us. And if you have any questions, I see some chat box uh, things. So we're going to uh, go through the questions. So thank you very much for, uh, for attending. Thank you so much, Dr. Reza. We do have quite a few um, questions. And while we go through the questions, um, I'm going to put up a, an evaluation poll for the participants. This is for Vincent and I. Um, so most of the questions follow a similar theme. And that's sort of that major tenant of um, you know, harmful algal bloom control is that do um, no more harm than the harmful algal bloom it's, itself and trying to control it. So the first question, um, I think, is a clarification question. It says, are you confirming that you're taking biological carbon out of the living life cycle and converting it to chemical non-biological life cycle carbon, similar to petrochemical carbons? 
Well, uh, that is not really petrochemical carbons. Uh, the petrochemical carbons would be used for more of, uh, 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 I would say, uh, burning the carbon into carbon dioxide again. So it's, it's more of a, yes, it's a biological carbon converted to a stable carbon source. Biochar has been used as a carbon sequestration. Usually half-life of biochar is about hundreds of years. So. Uh, even if we don't do any uh, uh, any water purification, uh, people have been utilizing biochar for carbon sequestration, a very good way of uh, stabilizing or, or, or tackling with, uh, with the greenhouse gas emission. Yes. Great, thank you. The next question, um, and I, we have to recognize that your experiments were at the laboratory scale, but considering you know, this 5,000 mile stretch of sargassum, um, they ask, you know, what's the source of the energy to dry and heat all of that sargassum? Um, it could be a lot of coal burning or gas burning to create that energy. No, absolutely. It's, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done that uh, techno-economic assessment yet, but our goal is not to utilize the fossil fuel to dry up or this, this process. So biochar making process, we want to make it as uh, 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 as environmentally friendly as possible. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a commercial biochar producer, but there are commercial biochar producers who probably doesn't need any outside uh, energy sources. Uh, we want to use some part because it is a biological carbon. Some part of the carbon can provide its own energy. Uh, for the drying and, and, and for, the, for the processing. Also, we could apply uh, the solar panels or, or renewable energy to actually drive this process. Again, I'm, I'm not a commercial entity, but this is where we, we would actually be looking into it. We're not going to, most of the biochar production facility, they would not actually uh, 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 plug in with, uh, 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 with the non-renewable sources of energy that I know of. Great. The next three questions are all related, so I'm going to do my best to uh, sort right. of combine them. So um, what happens when the biochar breaks down specifically to the carbon molecules as well as the arsenic that we know gets entrained within the sargassum tissue? All right. So that, 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 that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, let's see. Uh, the usual, again, the, the half-life of biochar is, again, it's, it's a half-life of biochar in soil is more than 100 years. When it breaks down to biochar, it would probably make, I mean, in 100 years, it would probably make carbon dioxide or methane, depending on the available oxygen to it. So that, 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 that's my understanding. Now, uh, arsenic or most of the heavy metal, we haven't tested that. I know me and Dr. Encomio, we have been talking about doing a heavy metal analysis uh, uh, over there in sargassum. That's, I'm very much interested on in doing it. Uh, but at, for the other side of it, when I was working with different kinds of biochar, we know that the, the heavy metals would actually be immobilized into the biochar. So as long as the biochar keeps it intact, the, the arsenic would not be available for the plant to take it. So that's my understanding. Again, we have to prove it for sargassum-derived biochar. We haven't done it. Again, this is, this is only the first year of the project. We have another two years to go. We have a little more room to roll. Great. We're looking forward to hearing the rest of those results as you move forward. Yep. Um, the next question, does the act of creating biochar and storing or recycling it work as an effective means of carbon sequestration? Oh yeah, absolutely. It is absolutely. So it's, it's a, again, I mean, uh, the biochar, uh, the, the International Biochar Initiative, uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 the, the U.S. Biochar Initiative, we are promoting the, the production of biochar to make a stable carbon sequestration uh, 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 pathway. So that's, that's what we are doing. Now, what, where I bring in is basically, okay, if I want to store it, why don't we just have one more application of biochar just to see whether we can actually do uh, 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 an another round of uh, like water purification, then it would go into the sequestration. Uh, and uh, we haven't done this one again. I mean, this is a, a little more room to go. Uh, we haven't done the regeneration of biochar yet. Uh, so uh, that, that would be a, 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 a task for the next year, we, whether we can regenerate the biochar 
Uh, and as well as if we can't regenerate it, how it is going to affect the, the soil? Can we actually use it as a soil sequestration or, 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 or carbon sequestration? The answer is yes. We just need to have some, some numbers from the Sargassum biosphere. Thank you so much. Um, that's it for questions in the chat. We'll stay on for another minute or two, see if there's any last questions. I want to thank you again for a fantastic presentation and for you know presenting to the water ambassadors. And we want to thank all of the water ambassadors for joining us for another webinar series. And hopefully we will see you on May 16th. Um, the registration link is in the chat and uh, topic is potential drivers of seagrass decline in the Loxahatchee. So thank you all. And thank you again, Dr. Reza. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Tafik. And thank, thank, thank you everybody for, uh, for tuning in.